been reserved for the king's pleasure. Therefore the king's portion is reserved for you. A prepared position awaits you with the king of kings sitting at the head of the table. He desires that you sup with him in the presence of your enemies. By accepting his personal invitation, your needs are met, the desires of your heart fulfilled, and to top it off you will receive the exceeding abundance above all you can ask for or even think of. Imagine that. The more you understand the king's heart, without a shadow of a doubt, you will begin to make more room for heaven's treasures. Welcome to King's Portion. This is Catherine Joy Foster. And the theme of our program today is not even letting inside and out. And this is part 87. We are going to continue our study about the last three women who were instrumental in working God's plan into the earth. So this would be part two. If you want to listen to the first part, that will be last week's lesson. Jesus' ancestry remained undercover from the foundations of the world. Look at whom God used in his divine purpose and plan to usher Jesus Christ's birth into the world. Each had her own fight but God gave them all the unfair advantage of a hosting his presence and power to ensure victory. All were undetected to the enemy, therefore unexpected by the enemy. God chose them to allure Satan into the battle to ambush him by Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. So with that in mind, we'll begin with the fourth lady, and that would be Ruth. And this is a statement we like to make about that. God is honored when you observe communion. You could see all through the book of Ruth how Ruth's impeccable honor and humility gave her faith, a resting place, communing with her, living in peace was her theme. Now, as the story begins in the book of Ruth, there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah. So Elimelech and Naomi moved to Moab with their two sons, Malan and Chilion. But after they got there and they took their two wives, which were Opa and Ruth, all three died. Their husbands, Malan and Chilean, and also Naomi's husband, Elimelech. After Naomi received word that God was causing their hometown to flourish again, she decides to go back and her daughter-in-law is going to go with her. And as they began their journey back to the land of Judah, Naomi was so grieved about what happened. She knew that it would be a hopeless situation for her daughters-in-law. So she said to them, go return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you shall find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lift up their voice and wept. And they were planning to go with her. But Naomi convinced them that that was not the place for them to be. With that in mind, Oprah went back, but not Ruth. Ruth clave unto Naomi and still Naomi was trying to get her to go back but this is what Ruth said in verse 16 entreat me not to leave thee 
nor to return from following after you. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And after Naomi saw Ruth's persistence, she just left her alone. They went and ended up in Bethlehem. And after that, Ruth says to Naomi, please now let me go into the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find favor. You see, Ruth's faith is so sound that she knows that she is going to find the grace that she needs to find. And Naomi agreed. But during the same time, Boaz was coming back from Bethlehem. And it just so happened that when he arrived, Ruth was in the field. And now Boaz is inquiring about her, whose damsel was this? So the person who was in charge over the reaper said, oh, that is a Mobitis damsel that came back with Naomi. And then he told her what she said to him and he showed Boaz her worth ethics. Then Boaz approached Ruth and he says, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that, that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? For this is what actually Ruth heard the young men say. He's just confirming his promise and oath to her. And when thou art a thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. She began to fall to the ground in honor of what he said. And she says, I can't believe all the kind that you're showing me, seeing that I am a stranger. And Boaz answered her, it has fully been shown me all that I've done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband and how thou have left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art coming to a people which thou knowest not here unto. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou have come to trust. And then Ruth said to him, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And then this is Boaz continuing in the favor zone. He said to her at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she did. She sat beside the reapers, but he was the one who offered her and served her the parched corn. And she did eat and she was very full and she even had some left over. And when she had risen to glean, Boaz continued to command his young men saying, let Ruth glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not and let fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So at the end of the day, even though she was there to glean, what she brought home was an ephah of barley which was more like a reaper's salary. And she took and she went to the city and showed her mother-in-law all that she had gleaned. And her mother-in-law 
knew that that was too much to be a gleaner. So she asked her, where did you glean today? And she said, blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she shewed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto Ruth, blessed be he of the Lord who have not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabite said, he also said, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said to her, This is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So Ruth kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest as well as the wheat harvest. And then it came a time in chapter 3 that Naomi said unto Ruth, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? And then she told Ruth where Boaz was at that point. She said, now this is the night in which Boaz winneleth barley in the threshing floor. And she told her, wash thyself therefore, anoint thyself, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto him until he has done all the eating and all the drinking that he wanted to. And he lay down. But mark the place where he's laying down, and then thou shalt go in and cover his feet and lie there down, and he will tell you what to do. And Ruth says, all that thou sayest unto me I will do. You could see her continue honor and humility with the instructions that she received. So she went down to the threshing floor, and she came in softly and, and covered his feet and laid down about midnight. He was afraid he was awakened and he found there was a woman laying at his feet. And he said, who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. That means that Boaz had the right to release her, to redeem her. And she was saying, cover all our weaknesses. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shewed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. And he told her, tarry tonight and then in the morning he would perform the right of the kinsman and to find out if the other kinsman was interested. And he, she lay at Boaz's feet until the morning as she rose up. He said to her, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, bring the veil to me and hold it out. And he measured six measures of barley and he laid it on her and she went into the city. She is now receiving, not just as a reaper, not just as a partaker, but now she's moving in to a favor that's beyond favor. She's planting a seed for an inheritance. When she returned to her mother-in-law, Naomi said, sit still my daughter until thou know how the matter will fall for the man will not be at rest until he finish the thing this day. So we need to see Jesus like that, that he will finish the things he has said for us speedily because 
he has already released us and now he's just showing us the covenant that he has with us covers us so in the fourth chapter you can very well see what is going on that Boaz goes to the gate and when the nearer kinsman comes by he said come here and take a seat because he wanted to negotiate with him and what he did was present Naomi's case before the nearer kinsman but the nearer kinsman didn't want to take Ruth as his wife because when you're taking the wife as a part of the redemption you'd have to bring up any children in that dead person's name instead of your own name and he said he didn't want to mar his inheritance so he said i can't redeem it so everything was made formal and legal because there were elders there and there were people in the city that witnessed it and that day was when boaz bought everything right out front so that he could also marry Ruth. What we find here is that everybody that day that was in the gate, the elders and all the witnesses that were there, they said, the Lord make the woman, talking about Ruth, that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which two did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrath, and be famous in Bethlehem, and let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore unto Judah, of the sea which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth as his wife, and when he went unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which has not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nurturer of thine own age. For thy daughter-in-law that loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and she laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of King David. You can see how God was using this for his advantage even though it looked like she was not the right person remember this it does not matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be when the holy spirit adds his super on your natural you will have the supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable so arise as a member of the body of christ take your place as a bride of christ that is his war bride. I'll be right back after this message from my sponsor. Please plan to stay tuned for the entire program today. The Catherine Joy Foster Music Ministries is a 21st century multimedia marketplace ministry. In your discovery, you will find the power of God present to go where you are, to take you where Jesus is. Raising you up, repairing you, restoring you so that you can be as Jesus is in this world. Now available for workshops, banquets, conferences, webinars, concerts, prayer meetings. You can call area code 216-486-8615, extension 1. Again, that's area code 216-486-8615. One five extension one. Proud to be an advertiser for King's Portion Web Radio. 
Thanks for staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Remember, it does not matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be. When Holy Spirit adds his super on your natural, you have the supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable. So rise as a member of the body of Christ. Take your place as the bride of Christ his war bride. We are going to still continue to talk about observing communion. And we're going to first show you what Jesus' sacrifice has done for us. And then we're going to move in taking the elements of communion. Beginning first in Isaiah 52nd chapter, The 10th through the 15th verse from the King James Bible reads, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Why? Because it can't be hidden. Everything that Jesus has done for us. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from hence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. In many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any other man and his form more than the sons of men. So that means that even if you seem unnoticeable, unrecognizable, forgotten, obscure, dark, beaten up, Jesus also was left unrecognizable so that you would be recognized through his blood and his body to God who calls you the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Never forget that. It says, so shall he, that's Jesus, sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him for that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they have heard not, shall they consider. And then it goes on to say in Isaiah 53, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That means that what Jesus had done for us, we need to believe. And it says to whom the arm of the Lord revealed, we need to receive, believe and receive. For Jesus shall grow up before them as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus is despised and rejected of men. Why? So that you can be accepted in the beloved, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, so then you can have grief relief. And we hid as it were our face from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not, but God esteemed him. And for his honor and for his humility, Before God, he is now the king of glory. Surely he was born for our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted as if he had committed transgression or iniquities, but he never did. But Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus and with his stripes, we are healed. For everything that he has done 
for us as us so that we wouldn't have to go to hell and receive eternal damnation to be forever separated from God who loved us as much as he loved Jesus. He says, for all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? That's showing that it looked like he didn't have any offspring. But in Psalm 22, it says that we are his offspring for we were birthed from his side. He said, for he was cut off out of the land of living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Speaking of the birth of the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, his war bride. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He said he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. But when we're taking communion, we need to make sure that we are singing the travail of his soul that he has done for us and be fully satisfied when we take it, knowing that everything is covered. To buy his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities, something that we could not bear. Therefore will I divide him the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now with that in mind, we want to take a look at communion so we understand what that really means for us as we take the elements. Looking in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, the 23rd through the 32nd verse from the King James Version, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which I've delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same matter, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death until he come. What well, they're saying, this is a memorial. This is something to always remember. This is something to never forget. This is something that we need to understand. The next part of it so that we would do it where it'll be an honor before God because showing our humility to receive what Jesus has done for us. Now listen to this. It says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What he's saying is that we should come and receive the elements just like God has given to us in honor and in humility. We're honoring Jesus for everything he did for us because he saved us to the uttermost. 
and we're humbling ourselves to know that there is nothing missing or lacking or broken because he covered it all. So we should receive every bit that he has done for us. It says, and let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, when you're going to the doctor's office and maybe for a physical, they're checking everything. So what you're doing is you are running your whole life through to make sure what needs to be covered. What needs to be covered? Does this need to be covered? Did this need to cover? So you're making sure that you're appropriating everything that Jesus done you piece by piece. And that's how you're examining yourself and your life to make sure there is nothing outstanding that should be covered by Jesus' blood and by his body. And this is what it says. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that is without honor, and without humility, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What it's showing here is that don't be so in a non-receiving state where God can't save you because you won't accept the provision of Jesus' sacrifice. Stay in a place where you are receiving. So everything that you can't do, you know has already been covered. You were saved to the uttermost. You need to say, I'm saved to the uttermost because Jesus body, Jesus blood saved me. This says, and if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He says, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. What is saying that we have been a purified as holy and chastened when we are corrected so that we can not only take the elements, the body and the blood honorably and in humility, but we can receive exactly what he wants to give to us in every area, there is nothing left out of that area of life, health, strength, prosperity, aid, welfare, deliverance, victory. Everything is included. It's all included. So with that in mind, on our program, we are going to enjoy the music of Alvin Frazier and he has Cassandra sing with him on this song. And the name of the song is Something to Remember. We want to make sure that we keep what Jesus did for us as a memorial that we never forget because of everything, our whole life, our whole eternal life, abundant life, the resurrection life is in what Jesus has done for you. Now let's hear Alvin and Cassandra as they sing something to remember and I'll be right back. Weekend. 
Thanks for staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the thing about our program, this is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Always remember, it does not matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be when Holy Spirit adds his super on your natural. You have the supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable. So arise as a member of the body of Christ. Take your place as the bride of Christ, his war bride. Now, the next part we'll be looking at is Bathsheba. Now, God is honored when you live consecrated. We're going to begin the story when David was king in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. And this is when the king's supposed to go to war, but David could not sleep and he ended up on his rooftop watching Bathsheba take a bath. And when he inquired who she was, they told him who she was. They told him who her father was and who her husband was. And David went and sent his messengers and sent for her. And she did come. Well, afterwards, her husband's still at war. She sends word to David that she has conceived and she is pregnant. David continues this vein to try to cover his sin. So he sends for Uriah, who is Bathsheba's husband. He wanted him to sleep with Bathsheba to make it look like it was his baby instead of David's. Well, Uriah was so loyal that he would not. He set out in a place where he could still guard the king. Then David tried to get him drunk. Maybe he would go home and sleep with Bathsheba, but he never did. After he failed at that attempt, he actually sent Uriah back to the battlefield with a note to the commander there to put him in front and withdraw from him so that he would get slain. And everything happened just like David said. And after Uriah was killed, then he took Bathsheba as his wife after the mourning period. Well, in the 12th chapter, the Lord sent Nathan, who was a prophet, unto David. And he said to him, there were two men in one city. The rich man and the poor man. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spoke to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring men that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man who had come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that does this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul and gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wife into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore have thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be thy wife, and have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon, who was an enemy of God. 
Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou have despised me and thou have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son for thou did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son and David said unto Nathan I have sinned against the Lord and Nathan said unto David the Lord also hath put away thy sin thou shall not die can you see how quick god is covering david's sin iniquity and transgression against him how be it because by this deed that i have given great occasion to the enemies of the lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die so the child did become sick the child did die. But after the mourning period, David comforts his wife and he went into her and they bear a son and he called his name Solomon and the Lord loved him. So let's also look in first Kings, the first chapter. And this is when David was old and advanced in years and he still was king but now here is his eldest son Adonijah who exalted himself and decided that since he was the eldest living son that he would be king himself so he promoted himself with the thought of overthrowing this whole idea of Solomon being king he had this feast and invited everybody to it and they were in full motion for it to happen. But Nathan heard of it and he went to Bathsheba and told her to go approach the king on the matter to make sure that his plan to promote Solomon was still in place. And so Bathsheba went to the king. And after she went there, she said, my Lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your handmaid, saying, Surely Solomon your son shall reign after me and sit upon my throne. Now behold, Adonijah is reigning, and my Lord the king, you do not know it. And is showing everything that he did in preparation for him being the king. But David didn't know any of this. And while he was talking, Nathan comes in and confirms it. And at that point, David goes into a whole nother level of actually crowning Solomon king at that point. And then he called Bathsheba back into the presence. And it says, and the king took an oath and said, as the Lord lives, whom has redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me. He shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. And he did just that. And there was such a big coronation for him that it resounded so loud that it caused even people who weren't there to question what was going on but the city was so happy about that and Ajaniah plan got overthrown but God's plan never got overthrown because of what Bathsheba was willing to do to make sure that God's plan because he loved Solomon was not overthrown so in chapter 2 this is what David said unto Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show thyself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Keep his statutes and his commandments, his precepts and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses that ye 
may do wisely and prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his promise to me saying, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and their mind and with all their soul, there shall not fail you to have a man on the throne of Israel. And even for us, that God honors us when we have been loyal to him in the life of consecration. I'll be right back after this message from my sponsor. I was just standing there basking in the sun and all of a sudden I was soaking wet. There wasn't a sign in the sky, so I was unprepared without an umbrella. But in the end, it just didn't matter. I loved every minute of it. I knew I was living under open heavens. It really does give new meaning to being overtaken by blessing. Not a dry spot. This is Fran the Fan of H-D-O-R. Uh-oh, here comes the rain again. Been listening to King's Portion Live with web host Catherine Joy Foster. Welcome back to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is a Nami blessing inside and out. Remember, it does not matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be when Holy Spirit adds His super on your natural. You have the supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable. So rise as a member of the body of Christ. Take your place as a bride of Christ. That is his war bride. We are still going to talk about God is honored when we live consecrated. So you see that in the story of David, he got his right and God was so eager to Give him the advantage. It was just as soon as it came out of his mouth, God was right there. Because God's compassion wants us to be helped more than we may want to be helped. But look at what we should be focusing on and allow the Holy Spirit to help us so that we can maintain the union with him. In the Proverbs, the fourth chapter, twenty. Third verse from the New Living Translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What is saying that wherever your heart goes, your life is going to follow. And then the same verse in the New American Standard Bible says, Watch over your heart with all. All diligence for from it flow the springs of life. That's saying that if you don't watch over it, it's going to flow the springs of premature death. And how do we watch over our heart? First, understand that this is the part in which we believe unto salvation and your mouth confesses it. But what happens is your heart, when we believe, we can never be a non-believer. You may not know exactly, have entertained what you're believing, but you believe something all the time. What is saying that when you are a unbeliever that means that you don't believe God can do what he says he can do when you a disbeliever that means that you don't believe that it can be done at all but you are eliminating God out of the whole picture is just that you don't believe that that can happen we want to make sure that we have this advantage not only that the words of life that we're taking in, the rhema word and the logo word that we're putting in us. Those are the words of God that he's exporting from heaven for us. But also we have Holy Spirit to help preserve us from falling. And I look at this in Psalm 3, 3 from the King James Version says, but thou, O Lord, art a shield 
for me, my glory and the lifter of mine head. Now in the Hebrew honey, that word shield means a prince has a limitless arsenal that guarantees perfect protection personally. This is our heart being guarded from intrusion, from delusion, from distraction, from the wrong course of life. What should we look at as well is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is our honor and our humility before God, but it keeps us in a place of consecration. In Isaiah 33, the fifth and sixth verse from the Amplified Version of Classic Edition reads this, The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. And he will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, moral and spiritual rectitude in every area and relation. And there shall be stability in your times and abundance of salvation, wisdom, knowledge. The reverent fear and worship of the Lord is your treasure and his. So it's saying that when God is exalted it is because he has been honored by us and we humble ourselves before him in our lives so that he can be king of kings and lord of lords and that we know this is what we see from him justice and righteousness and then we also receive stability in our times we see the abundance of salvation wisdom and knowledge and this is what he gives us because we are not bothering the flow. Also, let's look at this, what Jesus says about the heart. In Mark, the 11th chapter, the 22nd through the 24th verses from the Amplified Version, Jesus replied to them, have faith in God constantly. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart in God's unlimited power, but believes that what he says is going to take place, it will be done for him in accordance with God's will. For this reason, I'm telling you whatsoever things you ask for in prayer, in accordance with God's will, believe with confident trust that you have received it and they shall be given to you. What we're saying is that there is a place for us to have things that's going to work in our life because we know how to speak to it. We know how to expect from it. Let's also look in the King James Version. For in the 22nd verse, Jesus says to them, have faith in God. Remember, when Holy Spirit comes to us, we have the faith of God. When we invite Jesus Christ at that point, we have the measure of faith. What we're doing is that every transaction action that we have to make from there can be made because it's already deposited in us. What we're doing is moving any doubt, fear, unbelief from contaminating the faith. And Holy Spirit is able to help us. The Word of God is able to help us to get exactly what we have come to get from the Lord. Number one, knowing that it is His good, acceptable, perfect will for us and that he wants to give it to us, then we know we're receiving it. So it's not in a category of, and it is going to be, but is in the category of the yes, amen, it has been done. Now, the other thing is that verse 25 says, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. So what it's saying that the only thing that can keep you from not receiving from God 
On the other end is if you have any breach in your relationship with God. And when we don't forgive, that gives us a breach in our relationship with God. And we know this, that the word of God is able to help us as well as the spirit of God is able to help us move past any wrong doing that's been done to us to make sure that there's nothing between us and God but the blood of Jesus. I'm going to remind you of the words of Moses from the Amplified Version, the classic edition from Exodus 20, 20. And it says, Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you so that the reverential fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. What he's saying here is that the same time that there is the temptation, the way of escape is to choose the fear of the Lord. And this is what God says in verse 23 from the same chapter. He says, you shall not make gods to share with me my glory and your worship. Gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourself. Now let's go into a whole nother level of staying consecrated before God. In Leviticus, the 26th chapter, the first through the 13th verses from the Amplified Bible, the classic edition reads like this. This is God. You shall make for yourselves no idols, nor shall ye erect a graven image, pillar, or ospilus, nor shall you place any figured stone in your land to which or on which to bow down. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield her increase and the Trees of the field yield their fruit, and your threshing time shall reach into the vintage, and the vintage time shall reach into the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land securely. And I will give peace in your land, and you shall lay down, and none shall fill you or make you afraid. And I will clear ferocious wild beasts out of the land. And no sword shall go through your land, and you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword, for I'll be leaning towards you with favor and regard for you, rending you fruitful, multiplying you, and establishing, ratifying my covenant with you. And you shall eat the abundant old store of produce long kept, and clear out the old to make room for the new. And I will set my dwelling in and among you, and my soul shall not despise or reject or separate itself from you and I will walk in and with and among you and will be your God and you shall be my people I am the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt that you should no more be slaves, and I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect as free men. God not only wants to visit us, he wants us to be his sanctuary. I'm going to read another scripture from Second Chronicles, the 7th chapter, the 15th through them from the 18th verses. And this is what God says to Solomon after he repented. And it says that now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name will be there forever 
and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, and do accordingly to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. And then he also goes on to say what would happen when that didn't happen. But we're going to believe that that does not include us. But see, God is very comprehensive because he wants to show us his heart to do good for us always. He also wants to show us what we shouldn't do. So then that should help us to see the fear of the Lord that we already know for the potential of abiding in the cycle of defeat instead of the circle of his blessing. Now, again, on our program today, you're going to enjoy the music of Elvin Frazier as he sings for us wonderful love. How can we despise a love like the love of our father who loves us so much and so great that it casts out all fear, fear of torment, fear of being abandoned, fear of being separated from him. He removes that with his perfect love. Why? Because his love is indeed the power. I'll be right back after Wonderful Love. Safe by grace, and I'm protected by a 
Staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Remember, it does not matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be. When Holy Spirit adds his super on your natural, you have the supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable. Now rise as a member of the body of Christ. Take your place as the bride of Christ. That is his war bride. Now we are going to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, with this in mind. God is honored when you preserve Jesus crowned. We are going to look at Luke, the first chapter, the 26th through the 56 verses from the Amplified Version, the classic edition, and it reads, Now in the sixth month after that, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town 
of Galilee near Nazareth to a girl never having been married and a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, O favorite one, endued with grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed favorite of God are you before all other women. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled and disturbed and confused at what he said and kept revolving in her mind what such a greeting might mean. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace, free, spontaneous, absolute favor, and loving kindness with God. And listen, you will become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, eminent, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his forefather David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob throughout all ages, and of his reign there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no intimacy with any man as a husband? Because she's still looking at her status as being a virgin and not being wedded yet. She is not disbelieving it. She is not in unbelief, not believing that it can be done. She just wanted to know what she should be expecting. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a shining cloud so that the pure, holy, sinless thing, offspring, which will be born of you will be called the Son of God. And listen, your relative Elizabeth in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is now the sixth month with her who was called barren. And he goes on to say, For with God nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. Then Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, be it done to me according to what you have said. And the angel left her. He did not leave until she agreed that he can take her agreement, her vow back so that it could happen. And that's when it happened. That was the rhema word of God based on the written word of God saying that a virgin will have a son. And at that time, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town of Judah. And she went to the house of Zechariah and entering it, saluted Elizabeth. And it occurred that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with and controlled by Holy Spirit. So now here is little John and Elizabeth already enveloped with Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and then exclaimed, Blessed favor of God above all other women are you. And blessed favor of God is the fruit of your womb. And how have I deserved that this honor should be granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, the instant the sound of your salutation reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy and blessed, happy to be envied, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of the things that were spoken to her from the Lord. Now she has a witness, not only from heaven, but also from earth. And she also have what was written in the Old Testament. And this is what Mary said, because now she is receiving a confirmation from God and the prophetic word that she's going to release over the baby that is in her womb. 
And Mary says, my soul magnifies and extols the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked upon the lowest state and humiliation of his handmaiden. For behold, from now on, all generations of all ages will call me blessed and declare me happy to be envied. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name to be venerated in his purity, majesty, and glory, and his mercy, his compassion, and kindness toward the miserable and afflicted is on those who fear him with godly reverence from generation to generation and age to age. He has shown strength and made might with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the haughty in and by the imagination and purpose and designs of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled and satisfied the hungry with good things and the rich. He has sent away empty-handed without a gift. He has laid hold on his servant Israel to help him to espouse his cause in remembrance of his mercy, even as he promised to our forefathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returned to her own home, which that means that she was able to stay there until John was born, but also until she was showing. When we are carrying what God wants us to have, we need to make sure that we keep it undetected. So with that, we want to make sure that we look at just two scriptures to show us just how she was keeping him crowned. In 1 Peter 1, 22nd chapter, from the Amplified Version, the classic edition says, since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren. See that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. She was able to maintain not only her virginity, but her pure heart to receive what God had for her. And then in Zephaniah 3, 9, from the Amplified Version of Classic Edition says, for then changing their unpure language, I will give to the people a clear and pure speech from pure lips that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one unanimous consent and one united shoulder bearing the yoke of the Lord. But even though that Mary had gone through a lot of problems just carrying Jesus that she had explained this to her parents. She's trying to explain it to Joseph and he was going to put away her silently, but God came to him in a dream to make sure that he knew it was a, then they won the run because the enemy wanted to kill him by the king that was instead. Because usually when there's a king in place, especially during the Bible times in the New Testament as well, the Old Testament, you could see that if there was somebody that looked like a someone to contend with that current rule, and they had to go. But you have to understand this, that you are a part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the war bride, and we need a head and Jesus is the qualifying head, the King of glory. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is a time that you can ask him to come into your heart so that you can preserve him crowned with your heart and with your mouth. Why don't you say this prayer? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, acknowledge that I am a sinner and that your blood and your body is a sacrifice that I accept. And I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Cleanse me from every sin, transgression, iniquity. 
and I invite you to show me the way that I may understand fully that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And now I know that I am the newest believer in the body of Christ as the bride of Christ and will be considered your war bride. And that is non-gender specific. And I thank you for my salvation, my new birth. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, if you said that prayer, why don't you email us at info at kingsportionlive.com. That's info at kingsportionlive.com. And we'll send you some encouragement along the way. Now, let's return to the remaining portions of King's Portion Live after this message from our sponsor. We invite you to visit our new interactive website. Please log on to www.kingsportionlive.org. That's www.kingsportionlive.org. We believe that you will discover something that will speak to the royal blood in you. Thanks for staying tuned for the conclusion of our program today, which bears the theme, the tsunami blessing inside and out. Remember, doesn't matter how small or how great your contribution seems to be. When Holy Spirit adds his super on your natural, you have this supernatural disposition that declares your calling and election undisputable. So arise as a member of the body of Christ. Take your place as a war bride because you are part of the bride of Christ. We're going to continue the theme on God is honored when you preserve Jesus' crown. We are going to look in Revelation to show you just how you fit into the plan of God. In Revelation, the first chapter, the fourth through the eighth verse from the King James Version reads, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth and so he's the prince of the kings of the earth and we are the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have been chosen as a king and as a priest on earth. Now it says, behold, he cometh with clown and every eye shall see him and they also which perished him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. And this is what the Lord says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So now he's confirming what John said and what he saw. This is Jesus saying this. Now in Revelation, the Second chapter, the 25th through the 29th verses says, But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And this is Jesus. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. So you can see there is reward in heaven, but there's also reward in the earth. And this is what Jesus also says in Revelation third chapter, the 15th through the 22nd verses. And it says, I know that works that, Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because 
thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. It's saying that there is no fellowship because there is no consecration. Because thou saith, I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So he's saying that now this person is trying to live independent of God's role for them as a chosen one, as a body of Christ, trying to live without a head. And this is what Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And that gold tried in the fire so that you could be the kings represented in the earth as the king and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So now he's saying that in the earth, you'll be the priest representative of Jesus, who is the high priest in heaven. And then he says, and anoint thine eyes with I said that thou mayest see. For since Jesus is the prophet, is saying that we should still be able to see whether we have a prophet's position in the fivefold ministry, we still should be able to see because we have him in our lives so we can see as he wants us to see in the earth prophetically. And then he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be therefore zealous and repent. He wants to see the change. So we're going from change because now we're becoming more mature and we know what to do and how to do it because we're learning how to be in a relationship with him that is productive, that is fruitful. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He's saying now that there is fellowship where you're coming to him and he's coming to you. And there is an open door policy. And then he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and I am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Now let's look what happens in Revelations, the 12th chapter, the first through the 11th verses. And it says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was brought up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out 
with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. So you could see that this could be a replay of every woman who is conceiving. Now that woman is not limited to men conceiving spiritually. For Jesus brought forth the church from his wound from his side. So that's showing that there is the church of Christ, the bride of Christ. And now you can even see the war bride. So it doesn't say here that we lost. We are overcomers. Why? Because of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Christ. So this is a good verse for you to continue to say, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the cues of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. What we're saying is here is that our testimony is the blood of Jesus. So you said, I plead the blood of Jesus on my behalf. And that will free you every time. It will not just keep you as not guilty. It will make you innocent. And it says that you're able to take the sufferings of God that Jesus had, but also that we can get the glory of God because the Holy Spirit is resting upon you. Why? Because you're not grieving him. You're not vexing him. You're not quenching him in any way. Now, we're also going to look at Revelations, the 19th chapter, the 11th through the 16th verses from the King James Version. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Why? Because one crown isn't enough for Jesus. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So you can see the locust Word of God serves as the discerner. But the rhema Word of God serves as the detonator. And this is all the Word of God, Jesus and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So can you see, this is Psalm 24 also saying that this is the King of Glory, the invincible King of glory. And this is a time that we will be working with him at that particular level because we crowned him in our hearts because he first chose us. How would we like to leave you today? Each one of the women we talked about today entered into the war room. After the fight was finished, each one exited the battlefield with the banner of victory in her hand. 
this week's lesson unveiled the last three of the six women. Ruth's impeccable honor and humility repositioned her to birth Obed. Bathsheba's dauntless courage helped her to approach King David to ensure his successor to the throne was Solomon. Mary's unwavering faith gave her God's favor to usher Jesus Christ into the world. That is just the beginning of how God never withheld his best gift, Jesus Christ, from you. Now you posture your heart to welcome the habitation of God. Stay in the place he endorsed, empowered, and endowed for you. Then you too will be equipped to take the spoils of war. This is Captain Joy Foster for King's Portion, where we speak to the royal blood in you. You have been listening to the King's Portion with radio host Catherine Joy Foster. Today's podcast is available for download. Log on to blog.kingsportionlive.com or email info at kingsportionlive.com.